Okay, I think we're live. Hello, everybody. Tom Snyder here. Really excited to be at our first entirely virtual IoT demo night. Mm -hmm. Thanks for joining. I see already some emojis and things floating across the screen. That's really cool. Um, for those who've never been to a Riot event, this is one of our signature events. We hold it every October, usually at the Raleigh Convention Center. Tonight, we are coming to you wherever you are sitting, hopefully on your couches or somewhere comfortable at home. Uh, I'm down at Riot Labs myself, but our team is distributed kind of around the state and around the country, and I hope you'll get a chance to engage with everybody. Um, this is one of our, what we call riots, bringing people together in, in a good way. You know, riots are supposed to be a response to uh, to change, you know, or, or they, they kind of spark change where, where that's needed. We believe technology is always creating change. It's changing the ways that we live our lives. It's changing the way that we do business. And it changes the way that we compete uh, on and off the field, on the court, and as we'll find towards the end of this program, even on our computer screens. So welcome to this event to, that explores the, the latest in sports technologies. How has technology kind of changed uh, this particular industry sector over the years, uh, both our outdoor sports and then our, our indoor esports, which is a really fast rising uh, industry. So we're excited to bring a wealth of different programs to you. Uh, just as a quick reminder, uh, before we get started, we are a sponsor driven organization. We've got over 80 corporate sponsors. Many of them are here today. We've got an exhibit area and we've got a few times during the program where you'll be able to go out and sit down at some tables and, and thank them for their support and learn a little bit about what they do. Uh, we've also got a speed networking uh, function on this platform that I'm really excited about. I encourage everybody to give that a try during the breaks. The reason that you go to events, you know, when we used to do this in person, was not just to hear from incredible speakers like we, who we have uh, uh, with us today, but also to meet people and to make new connections. And we want to authentically do that. And and uh, and you'll have the opportunity to do that today in the program. Uh, I would like to thank in particular our title sponsor. I even wore their t-shirt, Fourscore Law. Uh, so thank you to, to Jesse Jones and the team at Fourscore. If you're uh, an entrepreneur or a young company uh, needing support, uh, that you can't ask for, for a better team. Uh, but with that, you're not really here to hear from me. You're here to meet our guests. So I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Jim Welter, uh, who has done a whole lot of amazing things in her career. And I'll let her share some of that. And then also uh, Keith Smart, uh, both NCAA champion, college basketball player, and NBA head coach. Uh, Jen, uh, I'll, I'll open with you. You've done everything from being the first female coach in the NFL, a uh, female playing in men's professional football. Uh, you're a, a children's book author. You have uh, started companies, Gridiron Girls. You know, you've done a whole lot of things. Uh, share a little bit uh, about your background, if you don't mind, with the audience. You know, I, I think what you see as the connective tissue in all the things that I've done is that, you know, I'm used to being told what I can't do. And I'm really bad at listening to that. <laughs> um, and then I like to solve human puzzles. Um, I think Coach Smart got the better last name for that, though. I'm having a little envy because I think it would have been great to have like Smart on the back of my jersey and be like, yeah, I am a football player and I am smart. So don't let that hurt you. Um, you know, I'd have been the double threat for them. So, Coach, I'm just letting you know. <laughs> Not over that yet, but I, right. I you know, uh, um, but for me, you know, it, it's like so many things. Our, our life's journey, when they're to, when they're fueled by passion, you will do the crazy stuff that other put, people wouldn't do because it doesn't feel like work, right? It's not like I'm checking in or doing it on a time clock because, frankly, if anybody was looking for a bad ROI, playing for a dollar a game um, for my entire women's football career uh, was not a balanced statement thing. There is a whole lot of imbalance. But when you see something and you believe it, like for me, they said football was the final frontier for women in sports. So that was always a challenge. And I promised myself when I made my first football team that I would step up to every challenge that the game put in my way. Um, I've a lot of the times had more questions than answers, but I think we can pretty much figure that out, especially if we have a great team around us. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I agree. You, you embody 
uh, you know, all the characteristics that we see in entrepreneurs that are working on startups and our programs and things that, that, that perseverance, that rapid growth you have when you challenge yourself to do something that's never been done before. So we're really glad to have you. Um, coach, we'll go over to you. Uh, love to hear you know, a little bit about it, your background and your story. And then after that, we'll, we'll start to, to dig into the tech side of this discussion. Well, you know, it's like Jen said, you know, with my name being smart, I always say when uh, I'll lose my mind and I'll remain smart. So no matter what takes place in the future, I will always be smart, you know. But like Jen's story, um, you know, I had one opportunity to go off to college. And that one opportunity was a guy saw me playing basketball in the rec center. And he saw me playing there and he came over to me and he said, his name is Lester Roberts. This is in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He came over to me and said, um, can't you see what's on your T-shirt? And I had a T-shirt that was probably dirty from playing. He, I said, what? It was a blank T-shirt. He's like, I don't see anything on this T-shirt. He said, you have can't miss on your shirt. You don't see that? I go, no. And then he asked the question. He said, uh, how would you like to go to college uh, and also play basketball? At that moment, I said, sure, yeah. I had no idea how I was going to get there, what was going to take place. Uh, I went back home, told my mom that there's a possibility for me to go to college and also to play basketball and told my dad. And my dad was like, OK, you can go there. But can you make a living doing that? You know, and uh, I said, Dad, I get a chance to go to school. So I, my basketball career took off just on someone seeing me play and uh, obviously being in, uh, ready to go. And that's all about life. You have to be ready to go when the moment strikes. And if you're not prepared and ready for that moment, you might miss it. It may come again, but you might miss it. But along the way, I played out in Garden City Community College in Kansas. Uh, and from there, played well out there, went off to Indiana, played well there, graduated and uh, won a championship, and then went to the NBA as a player, got cut from there. And then I got into coaching. And I wanted to get into coaching uh, because I felt I could teach some of the young players that I would come in contact with things that – I wish someone had taught me. And it also started to help me, but it also allowed me to get out of a comfort zone because we all go through these comfort zone periods to where we are comfortable doing this. Now we got to step into another environment. And once we step into that environment, it comes back to what? Being prepared for the next opportunity. And as I started to preach those things along the way of coaching um, and started to communicate uh, everything that I was doing. And five years ago, probably six or seven years ago, uh, as the analytics came into our world, uh, more prevalent in our world, um, I would not be able to be on here. I was like, hey, yeah. I'd be so afraid of that because I didn't know what it was, but I was stepping out of my comfort zone and started to see the big, bigger picture. And that's where I'm at today. So, so let me ask, I'll, I'll stay with you, Keith. The, uh, you, you talk about being prepared. You, you were prepared. You, mm -hmm. you, when the ball was in your hands and the clock was about to expire, you hit the shot to, to win the championship under Bobby Knight. You know, he coached a system before we were, uh, came on stage here. We were talking a little bit about, about different coaching styles. How have you seen, you know, technology from that point to, mm -hmm. to where you are today start to be adopted and brought into the systems of teaching and training and coaching? And, you know, wh what are maybe some of the fundamental changes that you've seen over the last mm -hmm. uh, couple of decades? Well, well, the baseline was always, uh, and Jan can attest to this, was always uh, your conditioning. You know, how you train, how you eat, how you prepare, get yourself ready for a basketball game or whatever sport that you're in. So that was always the baseline. And then you moved to nutrition, came in and now you you know didn't eat what you were eating before. And you kind of you know meld those two together between the training and then the nutrition. And then comes the numbers. And that started to evolve over time to where we are today. Now I need to work out at this rate, this speed rate at this moment for this period of time, okay? And you start to incorporate those three things into your training every day, um, and that's what you see we have now. So you went from, okay, I gotta go out and play and, and try to produce uh, in a basketball game for three minutes. Can I be as good and put out an extreme output in three minutes? Why do they have that? Because now we get a baseline of what your heart rate, what you're thinking, uh, you know, your fatigue factor, what takes place. And we have now where we can see all those measurements uh, to be able to relay, relay that to our players with how we set up our practices today. We, I mean, before, because as I started coaching early, back in 1997, uh, we just came to practice. You know, you got better by practicing. Well, yeah. now you have a ledger, you know, of what numbers need to be hit to make you a better player. That's amazing. Uh, so, Jen, 
on the football side, kind of how does that translate? And you know, you can bring all these analytics to, to, to help break down the game tape and to you know, you know, there's a lot of AI and other kinds of things that are coming in place, but but is it a substitute for kind of the inherent, you know, kind of knowledge and understanding of the sport that, that the coach has? Or, you know, can you augment that technology or does it sometimes get in the way? Kind of what's your opinion? Um, you know, I mean, there's a lot on this. Like, so first thing, um, a lot of people don't realize how smart you have to be to be great in these sports. Right there. And, and it's and it's not an IQ factor. Um, There's a lot of different theories of intelligence, and this is actually what my PhD was on. So I wrote my PhD on the NFL's use of the Wonderlic in player selection, which is funny because I really, at the end of it, found no statistical significance, no predictive value. And I wanted to write that it was a stupid test, but they said that I couldn't do that. Do you mind just, Um, for those that don't know that test, just share what that Wonderlic test is? And the Wonderlic is a 50 question test. Um, timed test that is supposed to tap into um, IQ. So somebody's general intelligence, which means it can't be changed. It's fundamental to who you are. You can't study for it. You can't improve a test score. Um, There was no research supporting this test, but it has a funny background in football. Believe it or not, Paul Brown was the first person to bring a playbook into practice. He said, I need my players to know the game better than what we can cover in practice. So he was also the first ones to say, I need smart players, which is a really smart thing, right? We do need smart players. IQ doesn't tap into that, but anyway. So he brought that in, started having success. Now. Whether or not he was the first one to use the Wonderlic or not, they don't know. But it became popularized by a team that was originally known as America's computer team. Do you know who that is? Can you take a guess? Hmm? I'm guessing the. uh, it's making me want to go back and watch Moneyball. (laughs) Yeah, Moneyball. So it was the team we now know as America's team. Oh, it was originally uh, the American team. computer team because Tom Landry was really the innovator on bringing analytics into football, bringing it in to scouting players, to who you were going to draft, and to breaking down opponents. Now, Landry used the Wonderlick back then. Um, There was no research supporting it. And so what happened is when the Cowboys were dominating because they were early innovators in in analytics, everybody looked at it and said, well, we just want to do what the Cowboys do. And that's how the Wonderlick ended up being um, a part of the NFL combine. But when we look at the analytics in football, right, and in basketball in general, there are so much stats that it's really easy, just like in anywhere in business, you could take those things and have them say a whole lot in a direction that means nothing, or have them say very little if you don't break it down in a way that's functional, right? And one of the things that you see is that's where stats become um, like that, that fusion of art and science, right? The numbers are there, but how do the numbers help you game plan? How do the numbers help you tell a story um, about the opposing team or the opposing coach, right? We had an instance when I was coaching for the legends where, you know, um, the opposing team, they love to use trick plays. And yet if you broke it down by formation, there was no rhyme or reason to the trick plays. They also love to run screens. Well, I just happened to be breaking down screens and trick plays. And I realized if you looked at it over the course of the season, the stats meant nothing because he changed the trick play and screen play formation. And they happened to be the same each game. So you actually had to watch the game tape to see that that was the one thing he changed so that there wasn't a pattern across the season. So if a coach is just going through, which a lot of them do, and break down everything that they looked at, not by game and by formation, but they just looked at it by formation first, then it appeared that this guy was just magic. And yet the truth is that there was 
there was a language to it, but you have to know how to interpret the data. So that's kind of the the fun art and science to me. Yeah, it's really it, interesting that the coaches are kind of competing against the analytics in that way. You are. That's what Jen, Jen said there when she talked about the pattern that you're trying to find. I started as I started to move and get into more of a veteranship of coaching. I started to not, not look at, I got this, the analytic package that I would get on a daily basis. And then I had to now try to compare that and condense that down to what I saw on film. And then I started now looking at what patterns were developing. So I started looking at games and looking at what was the team doing or this particular coach, what he would run or do in the last five minutes or four minutes of a basketball game. I started to see a wave and a pattern. So then when we got to four minutes to go in that basketball game, I can look at the sheet that I know that now, now he may not run it all the time, but the percentage numbers are on the side that most coaches, most people, most animals will do what they feel comfortable with in a stressful moment. And I would find a rhythm and find a pattern, just as Jen said, and can see, OK, the analytics says this. Here's his pattern. Now, how do we close this gap even even farther? And that's where your talent on your team now, because you have meshed now the visual, the analytics, and now the talent on your team is able to either stop that play or make a play. And, Coach, I'll add to that, mm -hmm. right? You also get coaches that, you know, when you look at a football breakdown, there's, you know, you chart how the game happened. So this was a punt or this happened at this and this happened at that. But that doesn't necessarily show up in the analytics breakdown, right? Correct. right? The game scheme. So then you get into the finesse of, you know, like for this trick play again, he only really ran them after timeouts. And it makes sense because you need time, right, for that play. And whether he knew it or not, right, it was like, oh, okay, now I have time. So what am I going to do when I get my team around me and we're going to put something in, which as a coach, you know, may take longer than one of the standard plays you put in from the sidelines. So mm -hmm. that game flow really is important. Yes. And, you know, in football, we tap into that, right? Mm -hmm. You've all seen that call sheet. You see the coaches mm -hmm. flipping up. Those are all situationals, yeah. right? You've already thought about, you know, I'm going to um, in red zone, right? Red zone is different than the rest of the field. So in red zone, these are my go-to plays, right? Um, if I'm backed up, you know, I'm probably not going to do a seven step drop or we're going to end up with a safety, right? Like you have to think about those things. And so as coaches, we're essentially trying to reverse engineer that call sheet that yeah. the opposing coach has. That's what we're trying to figure out. Mm -hmm. How does he break it down? How does he look at it? And can we stop it? You're correct. Correct. And, and I think it's really interesting, Keith, you described in our prior conversation, you, you actually watch game tape in a, in a fairly novel way compared mm -hmm. to most coaches because of some of these insights. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, I got with a coach when I first started coaching, and I told you the story. He won, introduced me, all the veteran coach, wanted to introduce me to the world of, of professional basketball preparation. And it was in the summertime, all season. And he said, we're going to start meeting every morning um, uh, to start looking over film, and I'm going to show you some things that I've learned. I said, okay, fine. Summertime, all season. We'll get together around 12 noon. And he said, no, we're going to get together at 430. I said, in the afternoon? He said, in the evening? No, 4.30 a.m. I said, okay. But what he showed me was. Coach, I know. 4.30 a.m. He said, okay. You had to walk to, Coach. That was that. But he said, how do you look at film? And I said, well, I look at this film from the first quarter down and get my, make my notes. He said, okay. He probably been looking at it the wrong way. I said, what do you mean? He said, because. In the beginning of a game, teams run, they, we call them fluff plays. They just run plays, and they, they score off of just the natural ability of the game. The game is not in the throws of win or win a loss right now. He said, look at the game from the fourth quarter and back up. Look at five minutes down. You get that pattern we talked about. And then you start to see that pattern that develops. So rather than looking at – so I started diving into games where I would look at in all close games – uh, what a team ran, what they did after timeout plays and all those things there from the fourth quarter, five minutes down. And I would have my play sheet there, my call sheet that this possibly can happen. And then I would look at other plays that I look at over four or five games and see, okay, they don't run this a lot late in the game, but they run it several times or 10 times a game uh, over the last five. They've run it. 
So this might be something we may want to pay attention to because they can get anywhere from analytical uh, thinking. They can get anywhere between four to ten points off of that particular play. If that's the case, then I must focus on this is some a play that we're going to have to worry about during the course of the game. But 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 our meat and potato would be what they do in their last five minutes. You know, we, we talked about having that printout sheet that you would get from the number standpoint, you know, where the numbers may show that a team shoots from the right side of the floor 72% of the time. And I said, well, why is that? Well, a lot of right-handed coaches draw their plays up moving right. So a lot of plays were dominant on that side of the floor based on just that. And so the numbers show, hey, they shoot too much on that side, but didn't know why because the paper won't tell you why. And that's where, because it was easy for me to look at film. I enjoyed that part that teaching I had at four o'clock in the morning, getting up to go. And my wife's like, where are you going at four in the morning in the summertime? You know, but that helped me now uh, as I moved through my coaching career, uh, to, because film becomes that next thing. And then you try to, like I said, mirror everything you have with your talent. Because when you have super talented teams, everyone will take that blueprint of that team. You know, because our leagues are all copycat. So if this team has done it this way, and once, every you, other team is going to do it. once you put it on the tape, it's far, it's fair game. It's That's open. It's okay. open. There's You're, no difference. What's exactly. Going? You know, we always say that is it's uh you know when Naismith got together and decided he wanted to make a game, that was the first and original playmaker. After that, it became it's an open playbook for everyone. Yeah. yeah. So let's, let's move off the field and off the court for a moment. You, you mentioned the importance of conditioning, of nutrition. You know, for either of you, kind of what, what, what's the advice that you give to players today that are, that are trying to work their way up? And you know, what are the tools at their disposal you know, to make themselves better athletes and better players? You go, Jen. Um, no, I think you're probably better tapped into this because okay. you kind of got into, into the technology. Mm -hmm. I, I was like fascinated. I'm like, really? Like, I'm like, dang, I want that, right? <laughs> I will yeah. like okay. Uh, well, you know, with each team now in the NBA, uh, they have a nutritionist, you know, that travels with them, that will uh, be out before them, calling the hotels, where they may be staying over, uh, preparing meals, because most teams now will have their own eating rooms for the players. They still will have the restaurants there, but they have their own particular room uh, for them to go to for their meals. And so those meals are all calculated out as to what it is they're going to have. They're going to eliminate a ton of sugar. It's going to be pretty much eliminated from the player's diet uh, that we can see because we know they still will get to it. Uh, you know, so but in that environment, um, you would eliminate uh, all the sugars. They would eliminate, uh, you know, create and make sure they have enough in their tank so they can run and play and, and compete in the game. And I'm and not get mentally blown out, you know, because. We had a couple of players that uh, that I've had over my career. They will forget to eat on game day. You know, they will forget, literally forget to eat on game day and try to go out and play in a game. Excuse me. So we had to make sure. We had to make sure that these uh, kids had these young men had the proper nutrition. You know, from what they were going to be drinking, uh, what they're going to be eating, their proper rest, all those things to help them get through that game that particular day. Maybe I need some sugar right now myself. <coughs> <laughs> Don't worry. Yeah, you know that so uh, move to, from that point of, of eating with how they how their nutritions are, are what they're going to be eating. Each player sometimes will have his own particular meal. What fits his body, and it's not just everyone. Some players will have their own uh, breakfast that they will have prepared for them in a certain way. Uh, they know if he had too much olive oil in his system. I mean, these things are all being monitored and testing because obviously you're, paying, you're putting so much money into these athletes that you want to make sure you can get a very good return on not only their athletic progress on the floor, but a way of how they can take care of their bodies. Yeah, particularly at that end of the game. If you got a little bit more juice in the tank, you've got a chance to, to be ahead, right? We, right. we work with a, uh, a company called Clario is one of our sponsors that has done some pretty interesting work in the sports world. And in fact, um, uh, a number of years ago had worked with the, uh, some of the U S uh, pursuit teams, the cycling teams that run around the velodrome, you know, round and round. And, mm -hmm. and basically by instrumenting both the bikes and the people and everything else, you can figure out to, to your point, exactly what each person should eat, how many times they should pedal before they drift from the front of the line to the back of the line, you know, mm -hmm. to maximize energy. You know, it's amazing how much science you see 
uh, in, in cycling and skating and NASCAR, other places. Um, where are you seeing interesting science, you know, either coming into the, the training room or the film room or just the way you keep in contact with players or, or what have you, uh, Jen, uh, in the NFL? Um, you know, one of the, one of the coolest innovations that I saw when I was in the NFL was the use of virtual reality. Um, you know, expertise is a, a product of exposure, right? And so when you, you say that expertise theory means that we automate the processes, right? Like we've all seen it and I'll use basketball because coaches mm -hmm. here. Um, when a little kid bounces a basketball, that basketball is the whole world. It's like, mm -hmm. right? Like nothing existed outside of it because he has to learn the process. And then as they get better, bouncing the basketball is like, you know, it's nothing. It becomes so fluent that it's almost like it's an extension of self. And that's what we say expertise is. So how can you increase the informational exposure and help automate the expertise process without, you know, like especially in football, having to take the physical reps, which, you know, require you to have all of those players. And so virtual reality um, has been put into where you can, you know, from the quarterback standpoint, see where all of those drops would be, right? How the receivers are there and get exposure because that's what we're trying to do as we watch tape, right? As a player, you're trying to get it to be familiar and fluid, right? Which makes your reaction time faster. And so being able to fuse virtual reality with like, you know, actual reality allows, you know, players to take their practice time and increase it exponentially without having to have what used to be known as like, I think the Peyton Manning rule of football where they weren't allowed to make players stay longer, you know, he used to do that um, mm -hmm. and make his players stay longer and, you know, kind of burnt people out. Mm -hmm. um, if the coaches weren't doing it, he was mm -hmm. doing that. So now Peyton Manning can take his butt to the virtual room and get in his extra rep count. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess a half step from from the virtual room is the video game room, and you've been involved with Madden and other properties. Like, how well are these games simulating the real real thing? And wh where do you like? What's that translation process look like? If I could design my ideal, it would be to, as a coach, be able to input my playbook into the games that they're already playing. So instead of them looking at paper, they actually got to play themselves out, right? Like, this is my job, this is my responsibility. And, you know, as a quarterback, I'm going through my read progression of one, two, three. Um, the post is what's most open because the linebackers che cheated up on the play action and the place between the safeties is the easiest spot. That is what I would do. Now, right now, what's great about them is they can go through plays, right, which obviously increases the familiarity of the things that you can do in the game. Um, but allowing them to be able to be their own position and to be able to, as a coach, input your playbook and then your opponents would be like the super dope way of actually getting into your playbook. And you would ensure that especially the guys with a short attention span Right. So from an attentional perspective, and that's me, right? Like just sitting there and studying like this, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to multitask and do cardio because mm -hmm. I am ADHD. But if you take it from an attentional processing perspective, which is what makes a lot of athletes great, like just sitting there and reading it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And yet if you could actively engage them in the process of learning, right, through a virtual or video component, you could exponentially increase their expertise. Yeah, it's really interesting. You know, you're discussing you know the VR and the games and all these technology components helping you to get to get smarter. To the point, uh, coach, that you made earlier, you're really smart in the game. Have you know great intelligence, make better mental decisions. There's a whole mental aspect yes. of this, and and um, so so what are some of the newer things that you're seeing in the way? to have people mentally prepared uh, to, to be at their best at that critical moment when they need to take that shot to win the championship? Well, there's some things that my, my, my son plays football in college and I would have, I'll, I'll speak with him on game day and I'll say to him, you got your routes that you guys are going to run. I want you to go out on the field in your pre warm up, 
And I want you to go through those routes mentally. I want you to count the steps. I want you to count when you make your breaks. When you now, I have no football background. So now, Jim, now that you can be on this team helping my son, but I, I, I share with him about run all your, your routes, count your steps. I do the same in basketball. Count your steps. And now when you make your break, you know, get your hands ready, your eyes ready, and target the catch. And now catch, and I always tell him to catch and tuck it away. You know, put the ball away right away. And it was a big play he had last year. And he called me right after the game and said, Dad, I went through that whole progression and every play I saw it. So I would take a, my players that I work with, uh, in, 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 unless I'm in football, but you have players just uh, 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 divided up amongst the coaches. And I may have four or five guys that I work with, uh, be it I'm going to talk to them about life, I'm going to talk to them about the game, uh, but also preparation. And we would sit before the game and just kind of take them through a mental exercise of what this game is going to be like for you t tonight. Now, I've done a lot of work already knowing how they're going to play you defensively, what they're going to allow you to have, and they're going to give you this shot at, at the free throw line. When you know that that shot is there, analytics says don't take that shot because it's a two-point shot. We prefer the three or the layup, okay? But I said, you know, this game is still played by the final score. You still have to put points on the board. So when you have an opportunity there, so I would take them through a mental thing there uh, of what the game could perhaps can be like tonight. And some more than often, oftentimes than not, uh, some of those plays will come to fruition during the course of a game. And so you have that point where you take them to a visualization of the game. Uh, then you ha also have them, okay, play calls. Okay, here's a call that this team is going to uh, be calling tonight. When you hear this, pass the information. Because when you sometimes when we get the information, we hold it. Well, I know what's going to happen. We say, no, when you hear it, you pass it to the, the rest of the team. But what that does is keep them mentally engaged in the game, you know, mentally engaged in the game. And even when a player is out of the game, you have to sometimes keep those players involved. Uh, Jen mentioned about the, the attention span. You know, athletes are ready to go. They're go-getters. They are ready to go. And so universities, classes are 50 minutes. Why did they pick that number? Because they know at 35 minutes, half the class is gone. We're going to push it to that 50 and see if we can get them to concentrate there. So why not condense the level for an athlete to take information in? Okay, 15 minutes burst. Get the information, watch film, look at numbers, get them away. Make them go do something else. Bring them back 15 minutes again. Take them to the next segment. Okay, let them get out. So we're as coaches today, we're incorporating everything, um, you know, for these athletes to go out and perform. And so it's not just going out and watching them play or run a football or catch a baseball or whatever it might be. There are so many things working behind the scenes uh, before you go. When I first started coaching, you know, I came in with just a little small pad and got ready for practice, you know, and went on the floor. Whereas now you have a total preparation day. And I mentioned with share with you guys about we have analytical meetings prior to that. You know, you have a medical meeting uh, prior to getting ready for that day where you're going to talk about uh, what the load management is on your players so they can go out and try to perform from a mental standpoint. Because if you're tired, you're probably not going to push yourself. You're not going to push yourself. Some push through in a game is different. But in a practice, not all of them will push through those things. So you have to be prepared for those. Do you do the have the same uh, focus, Jen? I know you, you, know, you come from a background in, in kind of the mental side and psychology and things. It, it, is this physical load balance? Is there also like a mental load balance? You don't push too hard on certain days and, and you do well, on others? Well, it, God, like the amount that you can retain in your short term memory is limited, right? And so what you want to do is to allow the athletes to take the short-term memory and convert it into long-term, right? Mm -hmm. Which is where like what coach was talking about when you shift from tape to physical, right? Like you're taking what you saw and allowing it to come and be done physically, right? Like that's why you notice you'll have a playbook, you'll have tape and you'll have the physical like walkthroughs. So what we want to do is make sure that we're upping the likelihood that the different learning styles will be meshed and it'll be converted because you can get it, but not get all of it. If you just sit there, the other thing that was great is you talk about active processing versus 
passive processing. I remember when I was the head coach of the Australian women's national team, you know, I pretty much at first was like staying with defense because I'm a defensive girl, right? And I'll let my OC do his thing, right? Like he was, he was my head coach at one point. So the last thing I was going to do was come over there and step on his toes, right? He used to say, Welter, I hate your face. That's because I messed up your offense. You should hate my face. <laughs> um, I mean, this was a thing. We were, we were like this. So when I was there, some of my players were like, Coach Jen, we need you more on offense. And I was like, what am I gonna, what am I gonna do for them? Like, I, I just make your life difficult, right? Like, I'm, I'm a defender. My job is to make you mess up. And then I was like, wait a minute. My job is to make you mess up so I can teach you how to beat me, yeah. right? I had to think of it differently. And so then when I went over there and I was with the quarterbacks, I noticed really quickly from a from an active processing standpoint, they were not being maximized. And I never would have looked at this if I wasn't thinking of it. First of all, the quarterbacks were on the sidelines. The backups were. Now, why? They can't see it like they would see it as a quarterback, right? So I moved all the quarterbacks, made them stand behind the starting quarterback so that they could take active mental reps. And then I made them out loud go through their read progression for me. You know, what are you looking on this? Are you looking at a blitzer? Then who breaks off the hot route, right? And who is your one, two, three? Because that way, as I say, like you're, you're practicing with the tape, as opposed to watching tape or letting the tape watch you, which happens with a lot of people, right? It's like you're looking at the screen. <laughs> yep. And you don't learn anything, right? <laughs> the more you can force active engagement, which means having to provide information, mm -hmm. the more likely that information is going to be processed because now I'm not just seeing like, oh man, I'm so mad that she's in right now and I'm not, right? Which is a lot of it, right? Mm -hmm. What is your mental, what is your, the, the, so our minds can only hold one thought at a time. A lot of us bounce very well, mm -hmm. but to truly be in the zone, you have to be focused on what's in your control and what is your job at that moment, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's, you know, like I said with the quarterback, which I'm not, but like, Blitzer, right? And you'll always hear like, who's the mic? 54 is the mic, right? So they're looking for that. Okay, take me through that, right? Or, oh, I'm watching somebody else do it, right? So are you fully focused on what it is that you need to do? So the more real life I can make it for a player when they're not in the game, the more likely they're going to get active reps as opposed to passive reps, even when they're not playing. So a lot of what coach said is very much on point and the visualization the visualization is powerful because what he's saying is we want you to feel like you've been there before right and when you visualize it makes it less scary it makes you less focused on the exterior things which are all distractions oh if they do this then this will happen and all of those if then statements which are death because if you're like, if I make this, then I got to make that, then you're already on to that. And you forgot this, right? And you see receivers do it all the time because the ball is here and they're already here and they wonder why they dropped it. Mm -hmm. I violate it to catch it and then run. Mm -hmm. But that's what that, that process is about to get the information to be more active and, and more likely absorbed. But just giving them tons, nah. You're only going to get a certain percentage of it. Mm -hmm. You're giving us a great look behind the curtain and, and kind of how we prepare the players that, you know, prepare the team and so on. We've got about five minutes remaining. I'd love to hear from each of you, your, your perspective on like, what's the next big thing coming down the pipe that's going to change the game. I know we didn't predict that we'd be, you know, playing seasons in bubbles and all this stuff, but you know, kind of COVID and those kind of things aside, what do you think is, is coming down the pipe, you know, in terms of new innovations that that's going to be a game changer? Uh, Keith, let's start with basketball. Well, I, I think what you saw in the NBA bubble, I yeah. think what happened, uh, we will hopefully we get away from having a bubble because we have to go into one. But what you saw was a tournament, a tournament style. The NBA has talked about this, but they just didn't quite know how will we put this together. 
Yeah. Well, that bubble has given them a huge blueprint. So in the event in the future, they decide to have six teams in, in this portion of the country, six in this portion of the country, six over here. We have a tournament play now. And so we can have one venue with six teams playing and competing over there and kind of have what you have in Europe. I played in Europe, uh, have the, the final four of Europe and have a championship there, much like college. I think that's going to be something that will come along because as everything else from the, 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 the analytical numbers, the physical, the nutritional numbers, they have that in both worlds, football and basketball. But I think this thing, this bubble that what took place in Orlando for the championship, it showed that it can be done. Uh, won't spend that much time in it, but you may have a two week period where you have six teams competing in that area, uh, which now will cr probably create another fan base of people coming to a game with four, with four or six teams playing in one uh, particular region. It's really interesting. And the NBA has been so successful uh, extending its brand into Asia and in, in Europe and other places. It, it certainly opens up the possibility of, of maybe truly international competition, I suppose. Yeah, because I feel that they'll probably say, OK, we're going to have four teams from the U.S. and we're going to invite six teams from Europe. Yeah. To, yeah. to spread around. And now you have a true world championship or a World Cup uh, game that can be taking place. Yeah. It, really cool. Very interesting perspective. Jen, how about uh, on your side? You know, coach, I got to say, when you talk about the bubble, I had a lot of my friends that were like, oh, my gosh, Doc, I wish we had you in the bubble. Yeah, I thank uh, you. <laughs> you know, and, and and I was like, well, you should call me. And they're like, mm -hmm. yeah, but I think people just think of you as football. And I'm like, I've been a doctor a whole lot longer right. than I've been football. And mm -hmm. those those are where the magic is. And I, I was I was like, I would have been in the bubble. I was in a bubble in my own house. Mm -hmm. Like I would have happily gone into the NBA bubble. So if you mm -hmm. go back in the bubble. You call me, you're I, I, I you get mm -hmm. your players' heads on straight. Right. Uh, from a football perspective, I think that they're going to have to open up the game a bit, um, meaning football traditionally struggles overseas and with women because they miss a lot of the beauty of the game if you've never played it, right? And if nobody's taught you, like, how to watch it and where the beauty of this strategy is. Like Madden, for example, um, does not do as well as like NBA 2K. Mm -hmm. Well, why? Well, first of all, uh, with the exception of some women, the majority of people who play football are dudes. Mm -hmm. So if you never played it, then that game, which is really complex, um, is intimidating at its front, right? And then the same thing overseas. Um, one of the things that um, American football, again, which doesn't really engender that, you know, love for other people overseas has struggled with is the ability to learn the game overseas. So I think the knowledge has been so like, you know, oh, we've got to keep it here and we've got to protect it. As we already said, coach, mm -hmm. once it's on tape, it's out there. It's right? So mm -hmm. I think we need to do a better job as people in football of finding ways to be more inclusive and to be more international. And then you're also going to see a big uptick in flag um, because the model's already there for flag to be um, an international and Olympic hit mm -hmm. before tackle football because tackle football inherently is expensive right. and in developing countries they struggle to, you know, get the resources where flag, mm -hmm. you know, flag becomes more like basketball and you don't even need a hoop, right? right? Yeah. You need a ball. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's soccer without, uh, with a different shape ball. Right. And, um, you know, I would love to see the, you know, the esports and video game model kind of follow that because I think almost like a, a three on three street version of, you know, of football mm -hmm. uh, would be really popular and fun and a lot more inclusive. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I definitely appreciate that comment. We, we believe that we need more inclusivity across a whole range of industries, but, but looking at those uh, like professional football that have not done such a good job, you know, that that's a great place to start. And, uh, and Jen, you've, had so many entrepreneurial ventures. I, I look forward to seeing that three three on three street video <laughs> game. Uh, it's coming. <laughs> I don't have the video game um, knowledge, so if somebody's yeah. out there, just holla at you, girl. <laughs> All right, yeah, we'll be happy to make a connection for anybody that uh, are in the crowd. But uh, thank you so much 
for spending some time with us. Uh, we're at time for this particular session. We are gonna be giving away an autographed copy of Jen's book, Play Big, uh, here in a few moments. So hang around uh, for the next 15 minutes for those in the audience. Uh, we've got some time for you to play around on this AirMeet platform. Uh, there, there's exhibitors to go visit. There's uh, lots of tables. Go sit down, meet somebody, try the, uh, the speed networking function. It's, it's a lot of fun. It'll give you a chance to, to meet some folks. Uh, and then we're going to come back in, uh, I guess, about 14 minutes now with a discussion about kind of sports technology. What's, what's up? Uh, it's going to be led by Larry Long Jr. He's a director, director of collegiate sport at Teamworks. Uh, and we've got a great uh, panel of speakers. After that, then we're going to get to our live event and we're going to see uh, an exhibition match between NC State and Barton College. Uh, we'll, we'll tee that up with a little bit of discussion of esports and, and understand for those of you that this might be your first time experiencing esports, a little bit about what to expect. Uh, and then we're going to get into some competition. So stick around, go ahead and, uh, and try out the platform. And thanks again, uh, Keith and Jen. You're fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. And Caroline, I'll hand it to you to do what.